Good morning students. This is Dr. Muhammad Gamil and today we have a long lesson discussing some of the diseases of the sinuses and its complications. We'll start by sinusitis complications. Last lesson we talked about sinusitis as acute and chronic sinusitis. Now we'll be discussing the complication of sinusitis. So what is the are the complications of sinusitis. It is the spread of infection beyond the mucoperiosteal lining of the paranasal sinuses. They are uncommon, but the commonest of them are orbital infection. They happen due to acute exacerbation on top of chronic sinusitis, which is the commonest, and may be due to acute sinusitis in children. Invasive fungal sinusitis usually cause complications. Complications can be cranial, which means in the skull bones, like mucosal, biocele, osteomyelitis. It can be extracranial complication, which means outside the skull, causing descending infections or orbital infections can be intracranial complication, which means in the intracranial cavity causing extradural abscess, cavernous sinus thrombophlebitis, meningitis, and brain abscess. What are the roots of spread of infection? Through the bone, bone erosion by osteitis in compact bone of the ismoid and sphenoid sinuses or by osteomyelitis in the cancellous bone of the frontal and maxillary sinuses or by a preformed pathway at a congenital dehiscence or a fractal line or opening in bone by a previous surgery also infection can be through veins by retrograde thrombophlebitis of the draining veins. Watch the figure. Cranial complications. Mucosal. It, it is cystic expansion of a sinus due to accumulation of mucus most commonly occurred in ismoidal and frontal sinuses. It may be primary mucosal due to obstruction of the duct of a mucous gland in the mucosal lining of the sinus leading to formation of a retention cyst or may be secondary due to obstruction of the ostium of the sinus due to chronic sinusitis polypi or benign tumors leading to accumulation of mucus within the sinus. The expansion of a mucosal will lead to thinning out of the bony walls of the sinus, expanding the sinus, causing pressure on the surrounding structure, especially the orbit, which is very close. The patient will show painless slowly growing bony swelling when the bone is thinned out the swelling gives an egg shell crackling sensation in a smoidal mucosal it will be at the medial canthus in the frontal mucosal it will be in the medial part of the roof of the orbit large mucosal produces proptosis if moidal mucosal, the proptosis will be laterally, and in frontal mucosal, the proptosis will be directed downward and laterally. What are the investigations for such a case? CT scan is diagnostic. Plain X-ray, which is not used nowadays, will show opacification and expansion of the sinus. The frontal sinus loses its characteristic scalloped appearance. 
how to treat that surgical drainage of the sinus and the mucosal and treatment of the cause of obstruction in secondary mucosal can you see this figure for of CT scan Here you can see the orbit and the M is a mucosal. Can you see how the orbit is directed laterally? Pyocele. Pyocele is cystic expansion of the sinus due to accumulation of pus which happens as a secondary infection of a mucosal. The clinical picture is the same, but it's painful and tender, and the investigation are the similar and treatments is the same as mucosal, but with antibiotics. Cranial osteomyelitis. It's inflammation of the blue skull bones. It is rare and usually happened in the frontal bones more than the maxillary bones. The patient complains of a fever, headache, anorexia, and malaise, and locally, uh, at, if we have frontal osteomyelitis, the forehead pain and swelling will have a forehead pain and swelling, and if it is maxillary osteomyelitis, maxillary pain and swelling. By examination, we will find generally the fever, and by local examination, we will have during the stage of osteomyelitis, in a frontal osteomyelitis will show a forehead edema and tenderness. Maxillary osteomyelitis will show maxillary edema and tenderness. And then in a stage of supraosteal abscess, the frontal osteomyelitis will show fluctuant swelling called POTS puffy tumor. And in maxillary osteomyelitis, you will show a fluctuant swelling. Then there's the stage of fistula. If this abscess is not treated, the frontal osteomyelitis will show a forehead fistula and maxillary osteomyelitis will show an oroantral fistula. On the figures, you can see the POTS puffy tumor and the forehead fistula. To diagnose such a case, CT scan is diagnostic. Plain x-ray will show something called mouth-eaten appearance and it also, it's also not done nowadays. Treatment, massive antibiotic therapy with surgical drainage of the paranasal sinus and bone infections. Extracranial complications. We'll have otitis media, pharyngitis, laryngitis, bronchitis, gastrointestinal disturbances, and orbital infections. Orbital infections, as we said before, it is the commonest of complications of, the, of sinusitis. It is inflammation of the orbital cavity and commonly happen in children. Why this? It commonly complicates ismoidal sinusitis because the ismoidal sinus are separated from the orbit by a very thin bone called lamina. Papricia. What is the clinical picture? We have a stage of orbital cellulitis, which is inflammation of the orbital contents without pus formation. The symptoms will be fever, headache, anorexia, malaise, and pain in the eye. The signs will show conjunctival chemosis, which means redness, limitation of eye movements, just limitation, remember this word, of salmoplegia, and diminution of vision. These manifestations 
are reversible with treatment. In the stage of subperiosteal abscess, collection of pus between the orbital uh, periosteum and lamina papyrusia occurs. The, the pain will be throbbing pain in the eye and by examination, proptosis and lateral displacement of the globe will be seen. These manifestations are still reversible with treatment. Stage of orbital abscess. Now collection of pus will be inside the orbit. The symptoms will be poor general conditions, impaired vision, and severe dropping pain in the eye. And in this stage, it is irreversible ophthalmoplegia and irreversible impairment of vision. The patient will lose his eye. For this patient, we have to do CT scan, which is diagnostic, and do fundal examination to detect the papilledema. Orbital complications can lead to cavernous thrombophlebitis, which is a fatal condition. How to treat it? We'll treat it by massive antibiotic therapy and surgical drainage of the paranasal sinus and orbital infections. Intracranial complication, we can complications. We will find extradural abscess meningitis, cavernous thrombo, cavernous sinus thrombophlebitis. As I told you, it has a very bad prognosis with high morbidity and mortality rates. Also, we can have brain frontal lobe abscess, and it is which is treated by surgical drainage of the paranasal sinus and the brain abscess. Now we will move to another topic in our syllabus called the polypi of the paranasal sinuses. What are polypi? A polypi or a polyp is a pedunculated edematous sinus mucosa which prolapses into the nasal cavity. The pathology of the polyp. A core of edematous submucosa is, will be infiltrated by plasma cells, eosinophils, and lymphocytes, covered by stratified, pseudostratified, ciliated columnar epithelium. The types are we have ethmoidal polypi and anthroquinal polyp. The ethmoidal polypi. Usually happens to have an allergic rhinitis, which is the commonest, chronic ethmoidal sinusitis due to infection, and allergic fungal sinusitis. We discussed allergic fungal sinusitis before. Here in this figure, we will show it shows the formation of the ethmoidal polyp, the pedunculated edematous sinus mucosa which prolapse into the nasal cavity. What are the symptoms? Bilateral persistent nasal obstruction, bilateral mucoid nasal discharge. By examination, we will see bilateral multiple pale grayish glistening smooth soft bedunculated grape-like masses which arise from the middle and superior metai. In severe cases, the polypi may protrude through the anterior nerves. Can you see in this figure, we, it shows the nasal polyp looks like a grape. And in on this slide, we will see on the right side the nasal polypi reaching to the nares, and on the left side is a CT scan showing a smoidal polypi 
Here's another figure showing another grape-like structures, polypi, and another CT scan showing nasal polyps. So CT scan will show the extent of the polypi. By the way, the behavior of this ethmoidal polypi will, is recurrence. It shows recurrence, which is very common. How to treat ethmoidal polypi? Okay, we have surgical treatment, medical treatment. Surgical treatment, which is the main line of treatment, will do endoscopic ethmoidectomy. And medical treatment, we can use systemic steroids for small pulpi, which is called medical pulpectomy, antihistaminics and local steroid spray, sprays post-operatively to avoid recurrence, which is common. Can you see ethmoidectomy on this figure? In ethmoidectomy, we transform a uh, the ismoid sinuses, which is multiple cavities, into one cavity. Entroquinal polyps. It is unilateral single polyp which arises within the maxillary sinus antrum, then passes through the, its ostium to enter the nasal cavity, then passes backward through the quina to enter the nasopharynx. It is less common than ismoidal polypi and usually happens in teenagers and it is unilateral and single. The etiology of entroquinal polyp is unknown but may be inflammatory or a retention cyst. In this figure, we will, we will see on the left side is the Entroquinal polyp, after it's being removed, we have two parts maxillary part, which is small part, and then the polyp will move through the nasal cavity to the nasal pharynx. As you can see, the difference between the size of the maxillary part and the, the uh, nasopharyngeal part which is due to the difference in size between the nasopharynx and the maxillary sinus. Here, in the right side, you will see the polyp coming out of the nasopharynx into the oropharynx. So, the symptoms will be unilateral persistent nasal obstruction and will be bilateral enlarged polyps due to nasopharyngeal obstruction and unilateral mucoid nasal discharge and also bilateral enlarged polyps. By examination, you will see a unilateral single pale grayish glistening smooth soft bedunculated mass which arises from the middle mate is passing backward to the quena and CT scan will be diagnostic. Here is another entroquinal polyp after it is being revo removed, you can see the maxillary part and the nasopharyngeal part. Here is a CT scan showing the antroquinal polyp. You can see on the left side how the polyp com is coming from the nasal cavity and passing backwards to the nasopharynx. And on the right side, this is a coronal CT scan, you can see the maxillary sinus polyp going out through its ostium to the nasal cavity. Recurrence of antroquinal polyp is uncommon and the treatment is always surgical. Endoscopic polypectomy with widening of the natural ostium of the maxillary sinus is the treatment of choice. Radical antrum or caudal lock operation may be done in recurrent cases. So what are the differences between antroquinal and ismoidal polypi? According to age, antroquinal is common in children or young adults and ismoidal polypi is common in adults.
the etiology is unknown in anticoagulant polypi and maybe infection and for ismoidal polypi it's usually allergic or multifactorial like infection or chronic sinusitis the number anticoagulant polyp is a solitary polyp and ethmoidal polypi are multiple the origin of anticoagulant polyp is the maxillary sinus near the ostium and the ethmoidal polypi are originate from the ethmoidal sinuses ancillate process middle terminate and middle meatus the growth of anticoagulant polyp grows backward to the quena while ethmoidal polypi mostly grow anteriorly and may present at the nerves the size and shape it's triopet for anticoagulant polypi and for ethmoidal polypi usually small and grape like masses now we will talk about a very important topic called cerebrospinal rhinorrhea which is leakage of cerebrospinal fluid from the nose this leakage could happen through a defect in the roof of the nasal cavity like the cribriform plate or a defect in the roof of the frontal ethmoid or sphenoidal sinuses etiology it may be congenital bony dehiscence or traumatic like accidental skull base fracture or inflammatory as nasal syphilis or neoplastic as intranasal cranial and intracranial tumors it also may be idiopathic no cause can be detected what is the clinical picture the rhinorrhea or the nasal discharge is usually or, or unilateral watery colorless salty due to the high chloride content in the cerebrospinal fluid and it does not stiffen in a handkerchief because it does not contain mucus so this is a very important differences between nasal discharge of a cerebrospinal origin and nasal discharge coming from the nasal cavity or the sinus because nasal cavity and the sinus all nasal discharge have mucus and also cerebrospinal fluid increases on straining and leaning forwards due to the increase of the intracranial pressure to investigate such a case a biochemical analysis of the nasal discharge should be done it will be clear colorless does not contain mucus or albumin and contains glucose more than 30 mg percent and B2 transferrin, which is a protein present only in the cerebrospinal fluid. CT scan with the intrathecal dye injection detects the site of the defect, and by endoscopic examination of the intrathecal injection of fluorescein, which stains the 3SF yellow or green, detects the site of the defect. What is the complication of cerebrospinal rhinorrhea? It can cause meningitis due to secondary infection, pneumocephalus, uh, which means air in the intracranial cavity due to forcible nose blowing. How to treat such a case? First, we'll start by conservative treatment. Make the patient rest in the semi-sitting position to decrease the intracranial pressure avoid straining and leaning forward to avoid increase of the intracranial pressure avoid nose blowing which allows which avoids pneumocephalus avoid nasal drops nasal backing to avoid meningitis antibiotics which cross the blood brain, blood brain barrier to avoid meningitis surgical treatment when if when failure of conservative treatment for two to three weeks by closure of the defect by a graft using mucosa fascia and or muscles or mucosal flaps 
from the septum through endoscopic, external, or transcranial approach. Another topic about the paranasal sinus are the traumatic disorders of the paranasal sinuses, like fracture sinuses. What will the patient complain while having a fracture sinuses? He will show a history of trauma, pain, which will be severe and may lead to neurogenic shock, bleeding, severe and may lead to hypovolemic shock, respiratory obstruction due to drop of the palate, and deformity due to external swelling displacement of facial bones. On the right side, we will see a classification for paranasal sinus fracture. It is called Lefort fracture and it's classified into Lefort 1, Lefort 2, and Lefort 3. Lefort 1, you will see the line of fracture. separates the middle third of the face from the oral cavity. It runs transversely through the maxillary sinus and the nasal cavities. Lefort 2, the fracture line is triangular in shape. It runs through the maxillary sinus, orbit, external nose and nasal septum. While Lefort 3, the fracture separates the middle third of the face from the o, the cranial cavity, it runs through the diagomatic arch, lateral wall of the orbit, superior orbital fissure, medial wall of the orbit, external nose, and nasal septum. By inspection, you will see an external swelling due to edema, hematoma, and surgical emphysema. You will see deformity due to external swelling and displacement of facial bones and by palpation there will be tenderness and crepitus. CT scan is diagnostic for such a case. The treatment is first we should restore the airway by translaryngeal needle injection or endotracheal intubation or tracheostomy and management of shock if present and then you will do reduction and fixation of the fractal bones by plates and screws. Another type of trauma is the oroantral fistula which is a fistula between the oral cavity and the maxillary sinus. It may be traumatic due to extraction of the second premolar or first molar tooth which is the commonest cause, or by doing a radical antrum operation when the sublabial incision does not heal. It can be inflammatory due to osteomyelitis of the maxilla or nasal syphilis, and it can be due to a neoplasia, like a cancer maxilla or a cancer palate. The symptoms for oroantral fistula are the patient can blow air from his nose into the mouth, unilateral nasal regurgitation of fluids, unilateral offensive nasal discharge due to maxillary sinusitis of dental origin, and the signs are the fistula can be seen through the oral cavity, a probe can be introduced through the fistula from the oral cavity to the maxillary sinus. However, this may disturb the healing of the fistula. And complications will be maxillary sinusitis. Plain x-ray and CT scan for such a case will show maxillary sinusitis and the treatment. If it is early small fistula, direct suturing of the mucosal edge of the fistula, and if it's late or large, surgical corrosion of the fistula by a buccal or a palatal flap and treatment of maxillary sinusitis if present. Now we will move to the tumors of the nose and the paranasal sinuses.
tumors of the external nose. They may be benign tumors, malignant tumors. The commonest benign tumor is the squamous cell papilloma. Malignant tumors, the commonest are squamous cell carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma, which is called rodent ulcer. A comparison between squamous cell papilloma, basal cell carcinoma, and squamous cell carcinoma. The squamous cell papilloma, its clinical picture appears like a word, usually in the vestibule of the nose, and it's treated by surgical instruments or laser surgery. Basal cell carcinoma is an, an ulcer with raised invert, inverted beaded edges with necrotic floor and indurated base with no lymph node enlargement, and it's treated by surgical excision of the tumor. Squamous cell carcinoma, the ulcer had a raised but everted, not inverted edges with necrotic floor and indurated base, and it may metastasize to the cervical lymph nodes. It is treated by surgical excision of the tumor and radical neck dissection if there is a palpable cervical lymph nodes. Tumors of the nasal cavity may be benign tumors, malignant tumors. Benign tumors like hemangiomas, uh, which is the commonest, and the most dangerous will be inverted papilloma. Malignant tumors, the commonest are squamous cell carcinoma, Hemangiomas. Its, its type is usually a capillary hemangioma, and the patient usually com complains of recurrent epistaxis. By examination, you will see a soft reddish polyp which bleeds easily on touch occurs commonly on the septum and called the bleeding polypus of the septum and it's usually treated by excision by surgical instruments or laser. Inverted papilloma. Usually it occurs in males above 40 years and it comes from the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. Although Microscopically, it is benign. It is an aggressive, locally destructive tumor, and the recurrence is very common. And it may transfer into malignant squamous cell carcinoma. The patient will complain of unilateral nasal obstruction, unilateral offensive nasal discharge, unilateral epistaxis. And by examination, you will see a unilateral fleshy red nasal mass which arises from the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. And by CT scan and MRI, you will be able to assess the tumor extension and by doing a biopsy, you, could be, you will confirm the diagnosis and its treatment, it's treated surgically. Tumors of the paranasal sinuses. We have benign tumors and malignant tumors. The commonest benign tumors are osteomas, and the most dangerous are inverted papilloma. The malignant tumors, the most common is squamous cell carcinoma. For osteomas, it, it, uh, its instance is commonest benign tumor of the paranasal sinuses, and it's commonly in the, in the frontal sinus followed by the ismoid sinuses. Usually, it is asymptomatic and accidentally discovered. It is painless, slowly growing, bony swelling. And if it is frontal osteoma, it is in the medial part of the roof of the orbit. And if it is ismoidal osteoma, it is at the medial cancer. The complication, it can lead to mucosal when it obstructs the sinus ostium and proptosis when it spreads to the orbit. Plain X-ray will 
show well-defined dense bony shadow and CT scan will assess the tumor extension. It is, treatment, it, it is treated surgically only if symptomatic or complicated by external approach. Inverted papilloma of the paranasal sinus is the same as we discussed earlier. Squamous cell carcinoma. It is the commonest malignant tumor of the nasal cavity and the paranasal sinus. It's about 3% of all head and neck malignancy. It's commonly ab above 50 years of age and usually in males. It's commonly the maxillary sinus and followed by the nasal cavity followed by the esmoidal sinuses. The predisposing factors, prolonged exposure to nickel can lead to squamous cell carcinoma and wood dust like carpenters will lead to adenocarcinoma. Clinical picture. Initially, it is asymptomatic. The manifestations are due to spread of the tumor beyond the sinus. The manifestations are unilateral. You can see in can on the left side, a cancer maxillary sinus will extend to the orbit, the, the face, the nasal cavity, the oral cavity. A smoidal sinus can lead cancer can lead, extend to the orbit, intracranial, nasal cavity. CT scan and MRI are done to assess the tumor extensions and lymph nodes, biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. It's obtained from the nasal mass or endoscopically from the sinus, and metastatic workup should be done as chest X-ray, brain CT scan, bone scan, abdomen ultrasound to detect metastasis, and the treatment are combined surgical excision and radiotherapy. Thanks.